In this video, we'll go over all of the new features included in JavaScript ES 2020. These include the string method matchAll, dynamic imports, bigint, promise.allsettled, global this, for in mechanics, optional chaining, and the nullish coalescence operator. If you want to stay up to date with the latest web development technologies, hit that subscribe button really quick before we get into it. Today's video is sponsored by Atlantic.net. Atlantic.net provides great VPS hosting and they are offering a free one gig virtual server with SSDs and block storage for free for a year, plus $25 in free credits to use for other services they offer if you use the link in the description below. It's super easy to use. After I signed up, I was able to provision a new server in less than 30 seconds. They also have incredible reliability and redundancy on their servers. So try Atlantic.net to develop, test, or launch your next project. Click the link in the description below and use the code STACKER to get your $25 in credit. StringPrototype.MatchAll is a new method added to the string prototype which is related to regular expressions. It returns an iterator of all of the results matching a string against a regular expression, including capturing groups. So let's look at some code here. We have a string here, it has an email and has two email addresses. And our goal is to pull these email addresses out. So we'll use a regular expression and I'm not gonna go over regular expressions here, um, but basically this is looking into the string and pulling certain parts of it out. And then what we would normally do is we could use uh, a for loop, a for of loop, and use string.match and pull those expressions out. And then we could console log each match. So I'll go ahead and save this. And here in our log, we have John at, e at Gmail and Mary at Gmail. So we were successfully able to pull both of those out using dot match. So the new addition here is dot match all. So let's take a look at that. All right, and I'm gonna comment this one out. And again, this is a for of loop. The only difference here is we are using match all. And so let me go ahead and save this and see what we get now. This time we get two arrays. Each array is returning our match, john at gmail.com. And then it is giving us our groups, john and gmail.com. If you notice here uh, in the regular expression, we are separating out our groups. So we're pulling everything before the at symbol and everything after the at symbol. And it's also giving us our index. Where is this starting at? and it's giving us our entire input that we started with. We also have this groups here, and it's undefined. So we are defining groups, but why is it not coming up in our groups in our array? In order for the groups to show up here, we have to actually label the groups in our regular expression. So I'm going to paste in another regular expression here, and the only difference between these two is that this one we are defining what this group name is. And in this instance, I named it name. You can put whatever you want here. And then this group I have named domain. So I'm gonna comment this regular expression out and then I will paste in some more code and let's comment this one out. And this time what we're doing is a little bit of destructuring. So again, we're using string.matchAll on the regular expression, but we're pulling out of this Index of zero, we're naming it occurrence. We're also pulling the index out, the input, and the groups. So this is just normal JavaScript destructuring. And then we're going to console log using a template string, the occurrence, which is the match, at the index with the initial full input. The next log is going to show only the name. So groups.name. And then the next one is the domain, groups.domain. And these are coming from what I named them up here in the regular expression. Okay, so let me save this and we'll see our output. So we're getting john at gmail at index number seven with the entire initial input. And then we're getting just our name and then the domain. And we're getting all of the same things with mary, mary at gmail.com started at index 22, and then the entire input, and then just her name and the domain. So in order to see these in the array, let me comment this out, and then I'll uncomment the one before that, 
and we'll save that and now we can see the arrays it's the same as before except this time now we have our groups they are defined as name and domain so that's it for match all the next new feature that we'll look at is dynamic imports dynamic imports in javascript give you the option to import javascript files dynamically as modules and this is just like how you would do it with webpack and babel or parcel this feature will help you to ship on-demand request code, better known as code splitting, without the overhead of Webpack or other module bundlers. You can also conditionally load modules if you need. And since you're importing a module, it never pollutes the global namespace. These dynamic imports return promises, so we have two options when using them. Option one, uh, we can declare a variable here, and this is going to be our dynamic module that we want to pull in. And then we use import and pass it the module. Since this is a promise, we use dot then, and then we do something with the module. The second option is the same, except we're using async await. And then as I said, we can use a condition. So if my condition is true, then import the module. So traditionally, we're importing all of our modules, whether we use them or not. Doing this dynamically will help speed up our site if we're not using these modules all the time. Big int is the seventh primitive type it's an arbitrary precision integer. Currently, a number in JavaScript maxes out at 2 to the 53rd power. It's a really long number. But with big int, we can grow beyond that up to 253 digits. This allows developers to deal with much larger numbers in data processing and data handling. Currently in JavaScript, the largest number that we can get to is this plus 1. So we can add 1 to it, and we get this. If we try to add 2 to it, we will still get this. This is as high as we can go with a number. So how can we go larger than that? We can use big int. So there are three ways to declare a big int. We can append n to the end of the number. We can also use big int and then pass in the number. We can also pass big int a string, and it will convert that into a big int. So big int is actually a different type than a number. So type of 2n is a big int. Type of 2 is a number. Now be aware that we cannot use these interchangeably, so we couldn't add 2 to 2n. That would return an error. We would have to convert one to the other and then add them together. So we could take the biggest int, which we had up here, which is the highest number that we can get to minus 1. So we could take that number and add 2 into it, and it would return a number higher than we can get to with a number type. We could also multiply it by 2 and go even larger. So another thing to be aware of is big int is not big decimal. So it is an integer. So this is what we would expect if we did 4n divided by 2n, we would expect 2n. But 5n divided by 2n is going to equal 2n, not 2.5n. It's always going to round down to 0. The promise.allsettled method accepts an array of promises and only resolves when all of them are settled, either resolved or rejected. It's different from promise.all, which rejects if any promise is rejected. All settled says, just run all promises, I don't care about the results. So here we have three promises, two are resolving and one is rejecting. So with promise.all, since one is rejecting, we're getting an error. Now if we try this with promise.all settled, comment this one out, and save that. Now with promise.all settled, we are getting three results in an array. The first promise is being fulfilled and we're getting that value. The second one is getting rejected and we're getting the reason why. And the third one is getting fulfilled with the results. So if you're using promises and you don't care if one of them rejects, you just want to see what is returned, promise.all settled might be the way to go for you. If you write code that's cross-platform JavaScript code, which could run on Node, in the browser, or in web workers, then you're going to have a hard time getting a hold of the global object. This is because it's window in the browser, global in node, and self in web workers. So in production code, you would have to write something like this to standardize across 
multiple platforms. So we're going to get the global object. And then basically we're saying if self is not undefined, then return self. If window, return window, global, global. And if you can't find any of those, then give an error unable to locate the global object. So instead of doing this, ES2020 brings us global this, which allows us to refer to the global object no matter where you're executing your code. So here we have globalthis.console equals window.console. And this is true. So global this, no matter whether you are running this code in a browser, in Node, or in a, a web worker, it's always going to refer to the global this. The ECMA specification did not specify which order for X and Y should run. Even though browsers implemented a consistent order on their own before now, this has been officially standardized in ES 2020. So there's really nothing else to say or demonstrate about this. It's just that they officially standardized on a process. When accessing properties, we often want to define a default value if the property we are accessing is null or undefined. The typical way of doing this is by using the OR or the double pipe character. This works well in common cases with null and undefined values, but what if we come across a value that's falsy? Sometimes we can get some unexpected results. So here we have an object and we have several values. And the first thing that we're going to do is console log values dot undefined value. So this is not within our object. And since that is undefined, we are going to return the smiley face. The next console log is values dot null value, which is here in our object and the value of it is null. So since it's null, we're going to return the smiley face again. These are expected results. The unexpected might be values dot empty string. So empty string is here and it's an empty string. And since it is empty, it is referred to as falsy. So since it's falsy, we're going to return this string, hello world. Again, we have values dot zero value and that is zero. Zero again is seen as falsy. And so since it's falsy, it's going to return 300. And then we have values dot false value, which is again falsy. So we're going to return true. Now this might be your desired outcome, but what if we only want to look for null or undefined and we don't care about falsy, then we could use the nullish coalescing operator. And so instead of the double pipe character, we use the double question mark. So the same things here, an empty string, is that null or undefined? It's not. So it's going to return the empty string. Zero value is zero null or undefined. It is not, so it's going to return zero. And lastly, false value. Is false null or undefined? Again, it's not, so we're going to return false. So again, the nullish coalescing operator only cares about null or undefined. Optional chaining syntax allows us to access deeply nested object properties without worrying if the property exists or not. If it exists, great. If not, it will just return undefined. This not only works on object properties, but also on function calls and arrays. So it's super convenient. Before optional chaining, we'd have to check to see if a nested object exists before using it. So here we have an object of animals and we have cat and some information on the cat, dog, some more information on the dog. So what if we were to try to access information that's not there? So let's say bird, we want to pull the bird age. What we would have to do normally is say animals.bird and animals.birdAge. So we're checking to see first, is bird an available property? If it is, then we're checking to see if animals.bird.age exists. So let's console log this and we get undefined as we would expect because it's not there. Now, what if we were to just access this directly, not checking to see if it's there? We're going to get an error, cannot read property age of undefined. So with optional chaining, instead of checking each level to see if it's there, we can simply add question mark dot. And if it's there, it will return the value. If it's not there, it will return undefined. So there we go. We got rid of our error and we no longer have to check for each level along the way. 
So the optional chaining operator allows developers to handle many of those cases without repeating themselves and or assigning intermediate results in temporary variables. So these are the additions to JavaScript ES 2020. JavaScript continues to advance and provide new and useful features. Let me know what you think about these and which one you're most excited about. Like this video to help me out and subscribe if you haven't already for more videos like this.